Hello, everybody. On this shortest day of the year, which for Octavio is the longest day of the year, um, I'm happy to present Octavio John from um, the University of Lima in Peru. Um, he has done a PhD and a master's degree in um, philosophy, and he he is now full professor at the University of Lima in Peru. He is also very active in networking across the Latin American region in astrobiology and has already organized several meetings in the field. The floor is yours, and I'm happy to welcome you on this last seminar of the European Astrobiology Institute in 2021. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Wolf. And today I'm going to talk about reflections, astrobiotic reflections related to space exploration. As you know, I'm a professor at the Universidad of Lima. And this is uh, a work in progress that I'm doing right now about astrobiotics, and astrobiology, epistemology, and so on. So if we're going to talk about astrobiotic, we must think in a historical context first. So at the institutional level, for example, the term astrobioethics has appeared for the first time in the International Working Group on Astrobioethics in 2016. 16, yes, led by Jesus Martinez Frias and Muriel Gargot. This multidisciplinary team represents the first use of the term within, within a formal research context. Before the, the, the term astrobioethics, it wasn't used very much, and uh, and why is this multidisciplinary? We will see it now in this seminar. And according to the Web of Science core collection, the first sorry, the first appearance of the term is from 2018 at the International Journal of Astrobiology. So, if we are talking about uh, ethics and astrobiology, or in the new term astrobioethics, this is relative new, a new term. Now, what is astrobioethics? What is about astrobioethics? Astrobioethics is a branch of philosophy and astrobiology that studies the moral implications of space exploration research related to life in the universe. It is a complex field of study because it assumes a number of scenarios that have not yet occurred, but which we can nevertheless discuss in terms of their philosophical, ethical nature. For the same reason, being heir to philosophy, its greatest nature will be in the logic and coherence of the arguments it presents rather than in concrete and definitive solutions because let's remember philosophy is more about the problem about the argument rather than a concrete solution or the way it should be more like a science and uh, according to peters if we're going to talk about astrobiotics maybe some of you will be thinking on astroethics so what's the difference between these two terms it is, it is a necessary distinction, something like that. The panoptic terms, according to Peters, astroethics and space ethics are inclusive. So this, this is a broader scope. They include reflection on the broad scope of ethical concerns arising from concrete procedures in space exploration, as well as speculation regarding extraterrestrial life. A more focused term, here goes the term that is interesting for us, astrobioethics, which concentrates on matters having to do specifically with bios, life. So astroethics is a broader scope, field of study. Astrobioethics is gonna be focusing only on the life elements, astrobiology implications on research of space exploration. Thus astroethics could discuss space mining, for example, or how to deal with the space debris and astrobiotics with the moral implications of, for example, endangering the potential presence of extraterrestrial microbi microbial life on Mars. Now, is, is this, this uh, only a conceptual difference? It could be said that the differences are only in name, of course, maybe some of you think like that, but that the fact that the decisions we make or the arguments we use could change according to the presence or absence of life makes astrobioethics a necessary area of study. Thus, it is not only a conceptual difference, but has quite mature implications in this regard. 
in the case of exploring an extra moon, for example, and not having any indication of the possibility of life, we will not be as careful as if we had even the suspicions of finding some kind of life or um, some conditions, possibility of finding some form of life, extraterrestrial life. So for space mining, for example, if you are certain, 100% certain that you don't, you will not find any kind of life or in the past life on, so let's say, exomoon or some Mars, for example, your behavior or your uh, procedures in research will be different if you think about the possibility, at least uh, a minor, minus possibility of finding life. So the way you act will be conditioned by this probability of finding life. Due to technological limitations, astrobiotics uses much of mental experiments, of course, in order to help us to extend the meaning and the use of certain concepts within the astrobiological framework. Of course, at the current time, we have not evidence or any discovery of life on Mars or in any other planets or exomoons, nothing like that. But that doesn't mean that we cannot uh, talk about it, uh, try to make some good arguments about it, because maybe eventually, maybe in our lifetime, we will might find uh, an actual presence or in the past presence of life. Uh, for example, as we see later in this seminar, we have concepts such as astrobiocentrism, biogeocentrism, teleempathy, and astrotheology connected to astrobioethics discussion. Now, ethics is not properly a science, as I said before, but enable us to propose critical analysis in order to make and take decisions. The astrobiotical issues does not necessarily imply giving an absolute answer to the moral implications or dilemmas that derive from astrobiological study. Ethics is part of philosophy. If it were, if it were the case that to provide solution that could be repeated in other scenarios, it could be more of a science. But ethics is not a science because philosophy is not science either. The philosophical value of astrobiotics lies in being able to problematize and in the process develop increasingly solid but eventually replaceable arguments. Therefore, astrobioethics is more about presenting scenarios and arguments that can be accepted in a consensus seeking debate. And this is a, a very important point because in the astrobioethic discussion, as here I say, part, being part of ethics and philosophy, the decision we're gonna take about moral, for example, in colonizing Mars, uh, under the possible presence of life there, it's going to be on a consensus. Many different point of views, debating, discussing, maybe not agreeing with each other, but at some point we will have to make a decision, and that decision is going to have to come out from a consensus. But that's a desirable a scenario, because then you have the political or military economic influence that some countries might have when taking decision in a, for example, a future outer space treaty involving extraterrestrial or astrobiological research, as we will see also in this seminar. Now, astrobiotics inherits the versatility of philosophy, since ethics is a branch of it and inherits the transdisciplinary nature of astrobiology. So at the epistemological level, astrobioethics is transdisciplinary because of the challenges it represents across different disciplinary contexts. So we know that astrobiology is not only about the biology uh, aspect, it's not only about the chemistry aspect or the astronomical aspect, it's also, as you can see, for example, uh, the astrobiology roadmap from the NASA or some other documents talking about the disciplinary nature of astrobiology that involves also uh, social sciences, humanities, for example. Now, transdisciplinarity is a way of working that involves and coordinates different disciplines. It generates strategies, strategies that interconnect proposals coming from different branches of knowledge. From this perspective, the assumption of ethical problems could differ from the point of view of a given discipline. So that transdisciplinary dialogue is necessary to reach an appropriate consensus. Let's say because some moral problems from determining 
discipline from bio biology, for example, might not be the same dimension of moral performance if you see it from the chemistry of philosophy itself. Now, this is a, a figure that can represent what I said previously and something more that we will discuss now. Here we have philosophy and ethics connected. Then astrobiology connects to ethics and then you have astrobioethics. Now, astrobioethics, we can think about it with three aspects. So let's say uh, that way we can order our thoughts and arguments. The first one, the legal aspect, second one, the ethical aspect, and the third one is the social aspect. There are three aspects then that should represent the initial points of debate of astrobioethics, the legal, the ethical, and the social aspect. The first one might be represented by our space treaty, for example. The second one, there is we find the discussion of humanity as a multi and interplanetary species, and the social aspect that is the social commitment of the astrobiologists with society itself, as we will see. Now, the first one, our space treaty, although we do not find anything in this document that is explicitly of astrobiological interest. It does establish the basis for the countries involved to explore space for peaceful purposes and non-appropriation of celestial objects. Let's remember this document is from the 1977 and well, the astrobiological uh, interest is, is not relevant at that moment, but let's see the one of the articles. For example, outer space and celestial bodies are not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means of use or occupation, or by any other means. It would be ideal to have an updated document or similar, whose priority interest is involved in astrobioethics, and not only astroethics, because if we think about this, our space treaty is within astroethics interests, but not yet within the astrobioethics interest. This has some limitation, of course, when activities are carried out I carry on in outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, by an international organization. Responsibility for compliance with this treaty shall be borne both by the international organization and by the state parties on this treaty participating in such organization. But what if this not this is not respected by a country outside the treaty? What if, in the name of research or of, or a form? of appropriation would be take place? What if a country invests a lot of resources to protect a certain area? Would it easily give access and use to other countries? The thing about some countries that they don't respect the nation, United Nations treaties, what about them? Are we expecting that they are they gonna respect the this article number six or number two or any other articles in the United Nations Outer Space Treaty? Outer Space Treaty, do all countries have an equal voice? Emergency countries, for example, like Peru, do we have the same weight in decision making in the case of a future, a new Outer Space Treaty with astrobiological interests? If we take as an example what happens on Earth with the United Nations, where not all countries have the same weight in terms of influence in decision making, there might be some concerns that something similar will happen will happen with with other space legislation. Although it is an area where there is no territorial appropriation, as we saw, this does not mean that for political reasons, some countries are not equally heard in decision making. So if it's if this is happening on Earth, why should not happen again in a cosmic context, let's say? What about the planetary protection policy? Well, this document is more up to date. We have a version from 2021 in the COSPER. Since it involves aspects of astrobiological interest, however, it does not represent yet a legal binding aspect with the country that applies it. So if someone violates the protocol, there should not necessarily be any type of punishment. Besides, there is no mention of the word ethics. If you look for, in this document, the word specifically the word ethics or moral, or moral, there is no further moral aspect on discussion, which is interesting because it looks like it's only a, a protocol, a technical procedure, but not more of a philosophical or uh, ethical reflection. 
Now, talking about the ethical aspect, the legal and ethical issues are not necessarily together. That's why ethical foundations are essential for setting the basis for an updated legal aspect. Sometimes the discussion of the legal lags behind the ethical. Here we will look at the discussion of humanity's status as, a, for example, a planetary, multiplanetary, or interplanetary species in the light of astrobioethics. Now, being a multi and interplanetary humanity, humanity. In the current context and with the expectations that we have about off earth travels, arises the idea that the human species is becoming a multi and interplanetary species, even though we have not yet solved our most fundamental, fundamental ethical and political problems. At least not enough to consider ourselves as a true planetary species. So we are thinking of self now, or well, some of us, thinking of ourselves as a multi or interplanetary species humanity but what about the problem political corruption things we have yet on earth are we becoming a multi-planetary species humanity even without uh, solving our own issues on earth why think about the future of humanity in space well according to bond there are four possible futures for humanity the first option is the status quo trajectory consisting basically in that humanity will remain more or less similar to the way it is managed now. The second option consists of the catastrophe trajectory, where humanity faces serious dangers that threaten its perpetuation as a species. The third option is the trajectory of technological transformation, in which humanity makes great discoveries that make its course change radically. And finally, the fourth option is the astronomical trajectory, where humanity is in the situation of migrating to other planetary environments to continue its existence. So is the maybe the first one, the one that uh, is interested for us because uh, we don't think that we might become in a transhumanity or maybe yes, but uh, as we see it now, it's probably that humanity in the future, if still existing as exists now, will have a future more or less similar similar as it is managed now. And uh, if we think the humanity as a planetary species, before we can even consider ourselves as a multi or interplanetary species, we need to reflect on whether there is a precondition for achieving these two concepts. Although we are aware of sharing a single planet, it seems that we have not really become an authentic planetary species. Is planetarization the same <clears throat> as having a world government? Of course not. At the level of, of astrobiotic discussion, humanity as a planetary species should entail greater solidarity and commitment to others beyond nationality, language or religion. However, it still seems that even with a common threat, such as the coronavirus, for example, that we are living right now, we have not yet had a commitment to move towards a planetary ethic, with a few exceptions, of course, if we think about the, the such as greater cooperation in research towards a vaccine. But uh, the thing about the comments of the director of World Health Organization that we might be facing a, a moral catastrophe because some countries are taking more vaccines than they need and leaving the other countries, uh, emergency countries, for example, that uh, with less of these, these vaccines. So this is a, an ethical problem, of course. And this takes us to think about maybe we have a dystopic future. The threat that not being mature enough as a planetary species could pose <clears throat> is that at some point our journey of art may become more of a kind of, of a dystopia than an ideal scenario of humanity's salvation. If by salvation we mean not being extinct, no problem. We will not be extinct if we go off Earth uh, in that way. In that. But that doesn't mean that we can live a miserable existence because of our ethical failings. This is more pressing if we think that a mode of government on Mars will have to start with something a kind of to a dictatorship, 
because of the environmental conditions humanity will face, which will greatly limit its freedom. And of course, we understand that maybe um, a Mars colony will have to limit the freedom of the people living in these special shelter, shelters. But what if, what if there is some uh, corruption problems, ethical problems, issues that we have to face? How do we really be facing these, these problems then? Inevitable expansion in the universe. Well, unless we become extinct, all long-term trajectories, as I said in the bomb metal source, involve our expansion in the universe. Even if humanity has to rebuild civilization, it will reach a point where it will have to explore other worlds. So this is inevitable, maybe not in our lifetime, but in the future, humanity will have to travel to other planets or moons so it don't become extinct. But the, the technological achievement we could have in the future, it doesn't mean that we will reach a moral achievement also. Uh, I, I can think that we are having more technological achievement than moral achievement. If we think about the moral and political problems in the past, in, in the Platon era and Socrates, the first philosophers, they talk about some issues that we are still are discussing now, about the education, about the, the best way of governments. Okay. Considering astrobioethics, we could think about the following scenarios in space. Humanity perpetuates its current moral behavior or the status quo trajectory, as I said before, or humanity improves its moral condition, making the future in space something more desirable. Let's say a kind of non-dystopic scenario. Which one we will be reaching? Well, we don't have this 100% certainty about it, but it is interesting to, to examine, to consider these reflections. So astrobiotics is not only about what we think about the future, humanity and ethics, it's involving also how we are now acting between, between each other. Because if we are still with our behavior on earth, as we have it now, even with the coronavirus threat, that make, you, make me think that the future of humanity in space, it might not be so different in moral terms, I think. I, I say, okay, multiplanetary humanity from a biological perspective. If we speak of a multiplanetary species, we will have to think that we have reached a point in which the inhabited needs of a certain planet differ genetically with respect to the inhabited needs of Earth. In other words, if we are talking about a different kind of multiplanetary species, the world itself a species evokes that we have some genetic differences with other uh, humans in other planets, for example. That is to say that humanity that managed to consider itself as a different species would have to, uh, re to present relevant genetic differences with respect to its peers that inhabits other worlds. Therefore, it will be more accurate to refer to this situation, as a, I said in a previous recent publication, that humanity as a multi or interplanetary species is not accurate. Better is to say subspecies. In a terminological way, this is um, a good option, subspecies. On an ethical level, and this is what interests us the most, being a multiplanetary subspecies would have more to do with the habitability we achieve in a planetary environment. This would imply that in the long term, humanity could develop on a larger scale Mars. However, this could lead to the emergency of an ethos characteristic of each planetary community, so that eventually there could be discrepancies and conflicts of interest in regard of other humanity living in other planets. Uh, maybe a, like a kind of solution, it might be, we, we can make a, a moral community sharing some more ethos um, above our 
contextual or habitability differences, or eventually genetically differences. But this is only a speculation yet. If we think about interplanetary humanity, considering that we cannot currently, nor in the medium term, be a multiplanetary subspecies for technological and time issues, we are left to discuss the notion of an interplanetary humanity. Uh, I mean by technological issues that we currently we cannot easily go to Mars or the moon, for example, to travel and set some kind of colony. And I mean by time issues, because it requires a long amount of time to develop this technology to make it possible, to make humanity uh, in a truly interplanetary species or subspecies. So this term interplanetary humanity or interplanetary man or woman, this term has its appearance in the year 1984 with Olaf Stapledon in the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society. And the meaning for it was the humanity's capacity to travel beyond the earth. Now, at present, we could say that we are entering to the era of an interplanetary humanity. Yes, at the beginning, we are the, doing the first steps. However, this concept is limited to a technological rather than a moral issue. That is, can one be interplanetary without having developed a planetary consciousness, consciousness on Earth? In other words, a interplanetary concept evokes to more the technological capacity that we have to go to the moon, to go to, to Mars. And once we achieve this technological issue, then we, we can think about us as an interplanetary subspecies. But that doesn't mean that we are um, a moral, a more moral, a better moral condition on Earth. One of the aspects that astrobioethics highlights is the fact that becoming interplanetary must be accompanied by getting closer to being a proper planetary humanity. I mean, the idea of being, of traveling to other worlds or other moons, it should be together linked with uh, looking for a, a better perspective in, a, in an ethical situation for us. And that's what astrobiotics is so interesting because uh, instead thinking that we are looking out outside the, beyond the earth and forgetting the problems we have on earth, no, astrobiotics is about, okay, we are looking for outside the earth, but we have to take care also, we, might, we have to make reflection of our own condition on the universe. For example, are we the guardians of life in the universe? This is the way we, we want to, to expand ourselves in the universe, the way that our governments are, the way the economy is working. The fact of being able to travel to other worlds must enhance us. Otherwise, we will be condemned to repeat any of the mistakes, many of the mistakes we are making on Earth traveling outside the earth should make, a, make us greater, not evidence our ethical deficiency. Now, in the other hand, the third, third one aspect of the astrobiotics, as I said before, the social aspect. This aspect refers to the astrobiologist's commitment to society. The fourth principle of the astrobiology roadmap by NASA reads as follows. The intrinsic public interest in astrobiology offers a crucial opportunity to educate and inspire the next generation of scientists, technologists, and informed citizens. citizens. Thus, a strong emphasis upon education and public outreach is essential. So, in order to adequately work with this idea, it is important to point out that we can identify some ways to communicate science in order to fulfill the opportunity to educate and inspire, as said, in the fourth principle of the astrobiology roadmap. One of them is science outreach. The role of public outreach refers to the level of communicability of science in the general public. For example, the use of a speech that can be suitable for everyone. Why is this way of communicating science so important? Basically because it is at this level that we find the fight against pseudoscience. Let us remember that talking about life in the universe can attract the attention of pseudo scientists, ufologists, for example. So the role of the astrobiologist is to inform on a scientific basis that is vital for a well-informed society. I mean, 
communicating, communicating uh, astrobiology knowledge from this astrobiotic perspective, it is important because we can contribute to inform on a, on a scientific basis to society so we can achieve a well-informed society. Well, scientific dissemination also is relevant, involves communication in science between a public who is in process of learning science, for example, amateurs, school or first year undergraduate students. And in this scenario, the educational function of astrobiology is to train future professionals who have the ability to connect ideas from different fields of study in order to provide adequate solutions to complex problems. This has the opportunity <clears throat> to train from a transdisciplinary perspective, overcoming the perspective of the hyper specialist or micro wise man. This is what UNESCO is looking for when they say that this is an approach to curriculum integration, which dissolves the boundaries between the conventional disciplines and organizes teaching and learning around the construction of meaning in the context of real world problems of teams. Now, this is very important because coronavirus problem, the ecological problem are not isolated problems. They need to be faced by a, a complex approach like the transdisciplinary approach. And finally, some interesting terms relevant for astrobiotics, as I say at the beginning, biogeocentrism, teleoempathy, astrobiocentrism, and astrotheology. What is biogeocentrism? According to Chela Flores, biogeocentrism refers to the way we understand life based on what we know on Earth, or in the other words, life based on carbon. Since we have no other point of reference, the biogeocentric paradigms assumes a position from which we cannot escape until we have evidence of extraterrestrial life forms. However, from the astrobiotic perspective, this is not a, this is not a limitation for if we want to consider of how we should handle in a hypothetical scenario other forms of extraterrestrial life, such as the teleempathic position that we will see below. So this teleempathy term has been coined by Charles Cockell and basically means that moral considerations should be extended to other extraterrestrial life forms. This concept would be a form of ethics that approaches a universal notion of morality, not limited to what can be considered as the biogeocentric paradigm. This term is best applied in the hypothetical scenario where microbial life are found on, for example, Mars. If this life form cannot defend itself, this would not detract from the fact that it has an interest which would be not to be annihilated. Moreover, because of its condition of being a potential second genesis and helping us to understand the phenomena of life in the universe, it is that this type of care is taken, unlike any other common bacteria on Earth. This attitude brings us a little closer, a little bit closer to an astrobiocentric position. And what is astrobiocentrism? Well, before that, an example of antiloempathic and astrobiocentric biocentric perspective, the establishment of planetary protection sites for environments of possible existence of life is a preventive and teleempathic way of acting to take care and consideration for the possibility of life on Mars and to delimit places where it has to be protected from any type of contamination from our part implies a position that teleoempathically speaking already has consideration for non-terrestrial life forms. In this sense, it will be understood as an astrobiocentric position from the astrobiotic point of view. Now, what is astrobiocentrism? It's the position that astrobiotics does not limit ethical consideration only to life forms of terrestrial origins, but it also includes future debates and the scenarios involving humanity as a multi or interplanetary subspecies. Astrobiocentrism refers to the word astrobiology, that's why the astrobio, which would be the way of or paradigm of understanding life form from a perspective of natural and social sciences, of the presence of life in the universe. Now, what about astrotheology? What is so important for astrobioethics? Well, another of the strengths that can be examined 
in astrobiotics is the way in which the search for life in the universe can affect the way in which the theological aspect is understood. According to Prior, astrobiology will bring a renewed narrative of meaning in the interpretation of God in the universe. For astrobiotics, it is important to consider the moral implications of astrotheology because much of the world's population holds some kind of belief in a higher being. Even if the researcher holds a singular position, as myself, for example, as an academic matter, is still relevant. Now, according to Prior, this interpretation of the divine in the world will expand in a way that embraces the conception of other origin of life. The interpretation of the presence of God should be that the divine manifests itself in everything, an approximate form of pantheism, and that humanity will find new ways of understanding the spiritual in this astrobiological context. Now, the idea of the divine will be manifesting itself in a refractionary form and not limited to humanity or the current form of humanity, leaving the door open to a post-humanity interpretation. In this sense, what he calls the Imago Dei, or image of, of God, would be a totally flexible construct in the face of the possibility of life in the universe or our expansion into it. In other words, uh, the religiary notion, the religion aspect, uh, will can give to humanity some new uh, way to understand the, the spiritual world in an astrobiological context. Understanding that the world itself, religion, religare, come from this Latin, religare, which basically means to link, it will have to adapt to the eventual discoveries of world with confirmed sign of life. This process as such would not be new, of course, since nowadays religions in general have been adapting to the scientific and technological world, world to a greater or lesser extent. Okay, some conclusions, astrobiotics deals with a series of topics which due to its complexity make it necessary to consider it as a particular field of study. Astrobiotics highlights the ethical problems derived from the investigation of life or research of life in the universe. However, it cannot give us a, an absolute answer as this debate is of a philosophical nature. Third, humanity is still in the process of planetarization and it may not finish its process when multiplanetary happens, maybe. Fourth, there is a need to generate a legal binding document at the level of the United Nations Outer Space Treaty that considers aspects of astrobiological relevance. And five, oh, religion will be able to adapt to an eventual discovery of life on other worlds. And that's it for my seminar. Thank you very much. Um, maybe you have some questions or comments. I hear you. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, Professor Chong. Thank you very much for your uh, talk. I had uh, um, something on my mind while you were speaking, and it is the concept of terraforming and oh, yes. the ethics of terraforming, which is this uh, uh, science fiction concept in which humanity changes the environmental the environment of other planets in order for them to suit ourselves and I was curious whether this is also uh, studied in astrobioethics, especially when terraforming yes. might conflict with local life forms. Thank you very much. Well, yes, uh, the level of a moral problem involving the terraforming process, despite the big amount of times that will take to terraform Mars, for example, is that is depending on if there is life or if there is was life because if there is currently life maybe in a cave or something like microbial life uh, our actions about terraforming mars will be uh, have maybe the the consequence it will be that first we must to study um this, the nature of this microbial life on Mars. And once we are, I mean, we have all the knowledge we, we need about it and thinking that it's gonna be necessary to go outside the Earth and live in other planets like Mars. So in a, in a scenario that it's absolute necessity terraform Mars, we will have to wait some time 
before start this process. Because if we started before uh, finding life or, or something like that, we might be uh, endangering this this different life form. So the the main point here is be sure that there is no any other life forms in the present or in the past because any of those will give you answers about the evolution of life in the universe once you are done with that with it you can go and start terraforming mars with no much of a moral problem problem maybe the other problems that you will facing are going to be political problems like the governance of mars uh, similar to a dictatorship for example and then you will have another problem that okay we are thinking that it's necessary to be to have uh, a kind of dictatorship organization on Mars because you cannot do you cannot go to a rebellion on Mars by the conditions of this planet. Uh, but okay, that's the ideal scenario. You're thinking like a, an academic. Okay, we all following the rules, but human humans humanity are not like. Um, I'm going to follow 100% the rules. Might be some conflict of interest, maybe some, uh, I don't know, discrepancies between the community inside these colonies and what we should do in, in, in those scenarios. So there is much to, to talk about this, this new form of, of governance in Mars. Yes. Yeah, look. Thank you very much. Okay, other questions and comments? Then I might ask a question. So what the Outer Space Treaty does not cover, as, I, as uh, far as I am um, informed, is uh, the activities of commercial uh, enterprises in space. Uh, because probably, I mean, this was not really on the radar screen of people in 1967 that actually mm. space flights that companies could actually do space flights once. Um, but um, I think that actually calls for an, um, an update of the Outer Space Treaty. And I wonder what actually, if there are some in initiatives uh, they are taking up this subject. Well, I know there is some discussion about including also mining space, but uh, currently we don't have yet some formal thing, some document uh, like the Outer Space Treaty that is already being like uh, 30 years ago uh, created. But currently there is still this debate about uh, updating the outer space treaty including mining space astrobiological interest but if right now for example some private enterprise goes to to mining for example the moon or or mars i think that i think that beyond the peaceful uses that they should have according to this outer space treaty um, there is no other implications now, but I think about, for example, what about a country, a powerful country that is not commitment, that it has not commitment with the United Nations? What about if this powerful country goes to Mars and proclaim it, itself the, the protector of this interested part for mining space, <clears throat> but also you have that uh, it might be possible presence of life. What should be doing the United Nations? I mean, what's the implication? What, what's the punishment that it would have? I mean, it is at the end, you think about it. If you have a, if you have a powerful country with weaponry, economy, and political influence, and goes out the space and do whatever he wants, uh, what you could do beyond um, telling this this country that it's not doing right? I mean, what's the, the material consequences or kind of punishment? I mean, I, I, I think this because 
me being here from in the United Nations on Earth right now is evident that not all countries have the same way in making decision. And what if this is going to be the same on Mars or on the moon? What if, however, you have the United Nations, for example, a massive weapons destruction, however, you have some protocol, some banned uh, actions, however, that you have a powerful country doing things that it should be doing on Mars, on the moon, or whatever. That's my main concern. I mean, even if you have a protocol, even even if the United Nations or even a, a outer space treaty, even with that, I think that this is a real problem, an actual problem that we must face this now. Other way, in the future, we will be repeating some mistakes that we are already living on Earth. Yes. Thank you. Okay, some further questions, please. Gianluca, yes. If I may, uh, just a brief question more. I'm interested and very intrigued at the idea of astrobioethics, and I was wondering whether in some astro uh, explorations in space, and I'm thinking most of Europa, of the Jovian satellite of Europa, which is somehow expected to host some form of life in its internal oceans. In this case, are astrobioethics, are people specializing in astrobioethics, consulted before these missions? I'm thinking, for example, of the Europa Clipper missions, in which the, uh, there is a rover expected to drill on the ice and possibly come in contact with it now. With an internal oceans and possibly uh, some consideration on possible contaminations of these oceans. So. Well, that's an interesting question because uh, currently, when the, I, I don't know that if astrobiotics specialists are being consulted or through maybe some institutional at the institutional level. For example, European Astrobiology Institute has a branch of ethics, astrobiotics. So any other space mission could con make some consultation to them? Maybe the NASA have it? I, I don't think so. So that's a very interesting question and a very interesting proposal to make also. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. OK. Thank you very much. Some questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Tony, please. Tony. <laughs> that, that was great, Octavio. The, um, one of the comments that you made struck me as is, is very, very interesting from a, the point of view of someone actually writing in, the, in this area, which is you mentioned the due to technological limitations, astrobioethics uses much of mental experiments. So there's these say uh, these thought experiments, and I find myself drawn to those as well in in this area. And it's not it's not necessarily because of a, a general ethical tendency that I have, because there are lots of areas where I, I I really don't run thought experiments at all. And, and yet there's something about astrobioethics that, that lends itself to that. And we think about things such as, well, what if we find a microbial life somewhere else? And it's like life here, and we're seeding a third place. Which of the life should we choose? Things of, the, things of that sort. Or we think about terraforming as we spoken here and really at this stage that's a colossal thought experiment and we're we're thinking about the entire discipline against its its against its its background but this is something that's always puzzled me um, about how we proceed in the business of 
of being rigorous in terms of ethics and, and clear about when we're when we think that we've got a, a an orderly demonstration that something is really the case and when we think that we are uh, offering instead a uh, hints clues and reminders about stuff that stuff that matters so i was wondering from a, a sort of methodological standpoint could you maybe say something about how far do you trust thought experiments when we when we run them? What do you think what do you think we're doing when we when we engage in thought experimentation in this context? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Yes, Tony, and thank you. Well, that's one of the great things about philosophy. Well, and also hence for astrobiotics, we can go further the empirical evidence we have currently. However, we don't have to forget that we are depending on the research that it is currently evolving on astrobiology. So when we are discussing topics about astrobiotics, we have to think about what we have on, on hand, what we have right now, what are the papers published about the, the research of life in the universe. So many of our thought experiments are depending on the latest uh, outcomes from astrobiology as a natural science, for example. And of course, uh, this thing of thought experiments is not new, of course. Let's like remember that, for example, uh, Gal is Galileo, right? I don't know, in English, yes. He made a thought experiment about uh, the, the ball in a um, no environmental scenario. He couldn't do it in, in in his age, in his epoch. I mean, he, he, this happened thousand years before, later to demonstrate this thought experiment. Some kind of that we are doing in astrobiology. According to the paper's research on astrobiology, we take it, we think about it, and we make some speculation, but with basis. It's not just um, a blow mind speculation. It's just we are uh, counting with the evidence that give us the authority from philosophy of science and from ethics to discuss it. So maybe if the out of outcomes from the research changes, our arguments will have to change also. And that's the way we, we work. And that's the way the science work also, because science is not about giving absolute answers. Let's remember to Popper, this philosopher of science. Science, also philosophy, is about being renewed, new researches, new proposals. In the case of philosophy, particularly, giving new arguments. And all the arguments might be replaced eventually for better arguments. And in science, new theories will replace the older theories eventually. So we have these parallelisms because let's remember science and philosophy are born together. Yes, thank you, Tony. <laughs> thank you. Okay, any other questions? Seem not to be. And in two minutes, there is the North of I winter. have a question. Yes, please. Sorry. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, I heard your, your question to, uh, uh, your answer to, to the question of terraforming. Part of that answer was about, uh, or you said that we need to make sure that there is no life on Mars before we start terraforming, right? And I totally agree with that. But the, the question is, how do we do that? And what does that really mean? So finding life and proving that we've found life, that's difficult enough, uh, I would say. But the question of what it takes to show that uh, the planetary body is uninhabited, that's a different, different question. Yeah. I wrote about this in a paper back in 2014, but I just, I just raised the question. I didn't give any answers. So I would like to hear what you, what you say about that. Yeah, thank you, Ori. Interesting question. Yes. Yeah, um, if you make that demand, where... I guess you need to say something about how to solve it. 
Okay, this is where biogeocentrism comes up because uh, we understand life based on the on the Earth view perspective. So, what if there is already life on Mars and we cannot detect it because our technological limitations connected to this biogeocentric perspective? Okay, there might be the the possibility that that maybe once apparently there is no life on mars at least not life that we can detect but eventually once we are already terraforming mars we discover that whoops there was life so what's the amount of time we will have to wait until we have a confirmation of finding life on mars that's totally depending on a consensus i think because uh, yes if we think about the this biogeocentric earth view understanding of life based on earth yes this this is an, an issue uh, and uh, imagining imagining that we have to terraform mars we have to move from the earth to mars and we have to make it soon uh, we will have to to take this decision and the decision will depending will be depending only on if we find or not Mar life on mars well that's that's a real problem because you might have the technology to find life but life on on a carbon basis but what if the life that it's on the planet we are arriving is not on carbon basis it's beyond the biogeocentric bio paradigm. So what would, would happen with that? That's an, a new challenge. And that's why astrobiotic is so interesting because it makes us think about this thought experiment. What would it would be if, what if? That's it, Eric. So basically your answer is that it's, it's a matter of time, how long you should wait and that in turn is a matter of consensus. Well, it's consensus, but if you add the time issue, that consensus will not depend maybe on if we find life specifically, maybe for political pressure. Let's remember the space race, it was uh, caused mainly because of the political pressure. Maybe the, the issue about terraforming Mars will face also a political issue and when political it's on the horizon well the scientific thing and the philosophical thing sometimes are, are let's say taken apart mm. thank you thank you yeah you're welcome it's a very complex scenario so i think there is mm -hmm. no one only answer it's going to depend on the on the elements we have on the site. Yep. Great, thanks. Thank you, Eric.